I wasn't getting my normal headaches, I wasn't getting weak. And day four, I was running on air. For me, the five day has really had, a, you know, I've lost half a stone now, couldn't because menopause, insulin resistance. And we gave the doctors and the patients a video to do a, a very light uh, muscle exercise for 20 minutes, I think it was four times a week. And the surprising thing, the, the women on average gain muscle mass and gain um, lean body weight. Are there other me methods of fasting that perhaps are more appropriate for different people that you believe could be as effective? The cancer cells, they just don't care what the environment it is. They're just going to keep on going. By definition, by the way, it's not my definition, mm. but the hallmarks of cancer. We could drive the cancer down, regression, and then the cancer stem cells slowly because of the glucose took over and the whole thing happened again, right? It's getting sophisticated enough to where we're like now can, can sort of smell that we're almost there. Right? Fasting is such a popular topic and we have none other than Professor Walter Longo talking to us today about the fasting mimicking diets and fasting in general. He's been on the podcast before, so you can go back into our library and learn a lot about the mechanisms behind fasting. And we also have Dr. Elizabeth Thompson. She is a medical doctor. She also specializes in integrative medicine and she's going to be sharing some of her experiences using the fasting mimicking diet at different intervals. You're going to find this super interesting. And remember, all the show notes are down below as well. Enjoy. Doctor's Kitchen. Recipes, health, lifestyle. Elizabeth Walter, fantastic to have you both here. I know it's a busy conference, so we're going to do this kind of rapid fire, but I do want to dive into some some incredible topics. First of all, why don't we talk about the conference that we're currently at the moment? Elizabeth, tell us about integrative medicine and the purpose of this personalized medicine conference that you've run. Well, we're pretty excited. We were planning it pre-pandemic, but we didn't know we were going to have a pandemic. Now to have over a thousand attendees per day mm. to really look at integrative and personalized medicine. Um, it's, it's exciting because it really is starting to feel like a movement for change. How do we get this broader, more compassionate model that has wellness right at the heart? Um, and today I felt for the first time like we wouldn't be that far away before systems can change. We can look after doctors, nurses, healthcare professionals, give them time because mm. we need time to really work with individuals. Yeah. Um, but also this range of approaches that science is now really helping us with. So things, you know, even in that last session, so leaky gut, crazy idea 10 years ago, loopy. Now with COVID-19, we start to really understand some of these factors that might play a part, what's happening with chronic fatigue. So I just feel like science is emerging really fast and this integrative medicine model is there mm -hmm. at the right time, at the right place. And this conference, I think, proves it. Look how many people are here, how many organizations, everyone wants to be part of it. Yeah, absolutely. And I think uh, it's interesting you, you say that about how these uh, previous ideas were thought of as fringe and now they're becoming mainstream. Walter, you've been on the podcast before talking about fasting mimicking diet and fasting in general. Now it appears to be becoming a lot more mainstream. What are your thoughts on how FMD has been uh, appreciated over here in the, in the UK and in the States? Uh, it certainly is appreciated. I think it's still a small group. Uh, I hope that um, whether it's everyday diet or, or the FMD, the periodic FMD, fasting mimicking diet, I hope that we can make it a lot larger and more in the toolkit of physicians, right? Mm -hmm. so, so we're not there yet. It's, it, I think uh, in general, we're still far, but, uh, but I think now the clinical trials are coming out and, um, and the basic research has been going on for a long time, but now the clinical trials are are really uh, coming out every month or so, mm -hmm. and, and you see that uh, they, they keep on working, and uh, and I think that's what's needed to uh, uh, to change the, the mentality of the of the public uh, health. Yeah. Absolutely, and uh, Elizabeth, you've got some personal experience of using yeah. the fasting mimicking diet. First of all, why don't we talk about what the FMD is, and then and your personal experience of it. Yeah, and, and may I just say that I'm a cancer doctor by training. So like some of my clients were starting to say, should I be fasting during chemotherapy? Even again, five years ago, I was saying crazy, mm. what an idea. So just to say again, that I think that's going to be a really interesting um, point to pick up. 
Um, but I also, you probably don't know that I've been doing the five day fasting oh, yeah. mimicking <laughs> diet because in my genes, I've got obesity, type two diabetes. Mother said to me, you're just going to get diabetes. There's no hope for you. So I, you know, watched your talk at the European Congress for Integrative Medicine, thought I'm doing it. So we could talk about that. Oh, great. Let's talk about it. Let's, uh, what, what's your experience? Well, I think there are really some important things just at a very personal level, which is that, first of all, is the cost. So my husband was saying, stupid idea, you know, paying this money. But what happens when your five day box arrives? is that that's everything you're going to eat. You start to forget about food or shopping. But the other thing for me is that I took it as a spiritual practice, a meditative practice. I came into the zone for the five days and I was amazed, like the first night, powerful dreaming, directing me. So I thought, okay, this isn't just about not eating, mm. but boy, oh boy, did it help me a few things. One, one is that, I ate three times a day every time I'm hungry. So that's, it's designed so that when you're hungry, you do eat something. Okay, it's not very much, but you eat something. The other thing is that I wasn't getting my normal headaches. I wasn't getting weak. And day four, I was running on air. Wow. That, that kind of metabolic flexibility that I know I haven't had genetically, that by day four, I started to really feel it. Just to say the second time I did it, I didn't carve out those five days in the way that I really needed to. And I struggled a bit. I was kind of dodging it a bit, but I'm gonna do my third one. Mm -hmm. And that actually should be enough for me um, just to you know, get where I want to get in terms of weight and abdominal weight and you know, who, you know, proving to the world I don't need to get type 2 diabetes. I have a really great diet, by the way. Yeah. So it's, it's not like I wasn't doing lots of good things. But for me, the five day has really had, a, you know, I've lost half a stone now. Couldn't because menopause, insulin resistance, maybe whatever. So I really feel that it's helping me as an individual. But I really want to start helping my patient clients Absolutely. as well. Yeah. And this, I think, is a good example of what changed since last time we spoke. Mm -hmm. uh, we just had a, a trial with 100 patients with relatively healthy uh, people. And that was followed by three clinical trials randomized. Uh, one just was just published by a group in Heidelberg looking at the diabetes patients and diabetic nephropathy, and, and particularly with the HA1C, um, with, uh, with the uh, insulin resistance, it worked extremely well. Also, the, the medication, lots of patients were able to uh, reduce medication, and, and they did it. It was interesting the way this, this published trial was done. It was either the fasting mimicking diet for five days a month for six months, or it was the Mediterranean diet for five days a month for six months, right? And the Mediterranean diet did absolutely nothing. Uh, and the FMD, you can see this really remarkable uh, changes. And I have to say, I had not very little to do other than telling them how to do the trial. So I like these trials, although I'm, not dis I'm disappointed. I'm not the last author, but yeah. I, I like them because uh, uh, you know, they're truly independent. And, and this is not a group that was trying to please me or anybody else. And so, and then there's two more, you know, Leiden finished their 100 patient trial on diabetes. And I can say that certainly very, very positive. Um, and we finished one in uh, Tennessee and hypertension, lots of uh, people with uh, um, high glucose levels. And then, uh, um, yeah, there's a few more uh, around. So we're starting to get to now every three, 400 patient type mm -hmm. trials, multiple sites very, very similar results. And so it looks like about um, the, uh, the unlock, unlocking of the insulin resistance lack, let's mm -hmm. say, right? Mm -hmm. So it's like the winter mode and the summer mode. The summer, you're, you're lock into the fat accumulation mode because a lot of food historically, and in the winter, you start burning it. And I think everybody's stuck in this summer mode, right? Mm -hmm. This, uh, this uh, accumulate as much fat as possible. Um, but then we also seen benefits that are independent of the weight loss. So we're starting to see uh, both uh, the, the weight loss dependent effects and the weight loss independent effects of doing some statistical analysis. So this is very interesting. Uh, uh, and we're, we're very, very excited, you know, for the first year ever yeah. to, to, to see this uh, clinical um, overwhelming data. Yeah. yeah, that's sort of the pinnacle of where you want to get to, where you have multiple centers doing replicable studies that you've done in your centers 
independent of your meddling or your you know your direction so that's that's really encouraging to see i think the mechanisms that you just described there i think are very telling also i know from your practice as a as a oncology uh, oncology doctor and oncology yeah. practice um this fmd and its utility in in treatment is very interesting to you as well i wonder if we could talk a bit about about that yeah just that you know you don't want to stress people you don't want them to lose weight you know and yet this kind of resting phase that can be so important for people while the chemo is doing its job for the cancer cells so i really just want to ask volta you know just to help me really understand how one cares for those elements, because I know that that will be a worry for a lot of mainstream oncologists. What do you think is the worry? Uh, so the worry would be that someone undergoing chemotherapy, you know, over a long course, who's quite weakened and a bit vulnerable, well, then mm. for them to fast, you yeah. know, like how do we how do we make that work? Yeah, so so same as for diabetes and pre-diabetes. Now we're getting to the five, six hundred uh, uh, patient tested in formal clinical trials uh, with the FMD, and we, um, we, I mean, we and lots of our collaborators. Some some cases have nothing to do with us. Um, have excluded very few people. Uh, surprisingly, right? And, and and now lots of the trials are including phase angle measurements, so muscle function, muscle loss either the DEXAs or other impedentiometry. And, uh, and as we've seen for non-cancer patients, there's very little lean body mass loss. And I'll show it uh, today. Mm -hmm. And so now there's the third or fourth clinical trial, uh, very uh, consistent results. Now, in the trial in Genova with hormone therapy, um, you know, palbosic um, the, um, the and we, um, we gave the doctors and the patients a video to do a, a very light uh, muscle exercise for 20 minutes, I think it was four times a week. And the uh, surprising thing, they, the women on average gained muscle mass and gained um, lean body weight uh, uh, function. And uh, um, yeah, so I think that maybe we exaggerate in that case, or they exaggerated because the, the feeding between cycles was probably too much. And I was fighting very hard because they said, you know, if you're a cancer, if you're an oncologist and a cancer patient, your biggest fight is the cancer, right? Mm -hmm. And the second biggest fight is then the weight and the muscle, but, but you got to focus on the cancer. And so in this case, there is a silos. And in one silos, you have the doctors at the hospital in Genova, they were worrying about the weight exactly. and only the weight. Yeah. And the other silos was the oncologist who was afraid of telling the, of listening to us and telling the, the weight doctor, the, the diet doctor, uh, no, no, no let's keep him, you know, that's okay. We can push him, n not over the edge, but certainly to, you know, keep the, the normal uh, lean body mass. But I lost that, that fight, and I think it probably was not good at all for the, for the cancer, right? It, it was okay for the patient, but not for the ca ca cancer in these patients. And so that's a discussion to have had very quickly, because this is, you know, now uh, Vernieri, University of Milan, uh, the cancer center that they're about to publish a new study, and I, out of 100 patients, they're starting to see what they call exceptional response in about 5%, mm -hmm. regardless of the cancer, pancreatic cancer, colorectal cancer, whereas they're starting to see cancer-free, long-term survival in the type of patients that you say, there's no way that this patient is going to uh, live a long life. So, yeah, so I think it's, it's important to, uh, to generate sort of like a working group that says, okay, we don't want to put anybody at risk, mm -hmm. but... Could it be that if we combine the standard of care with the fasting making diet, we can get this exceptional survival maybe in 20, 30 percent of the yeah. patients? And so, yeah. Just to anchor the listener, uh, because it might be unclear as to why we're so worried about weight loss in cancer patients. Traditionally, it's associated with a worse outcome when it comes to chemotherapy. If you see weight dropping off, it's usually not a good sign. And so when you see weight dropping off, even though it might be lean body mass, you can, you can understand why it sends alarm bells to oncology. Doctors, have I got that? Yeah, definitely. Yeah. That is why it would send alarm bells. And But it feels like you're getting that conversation across. And 
I guess listening, I also wonder about those exceptional patients, whether they're also doing other things, mm. because we know that the empowered person is actually trying to break through to be doing other things. That's why they've often come to me and said, you know, what about fasting? But they're already doing a range of other things like mistletoe, diet, exercise. Are you looking at that element as well of how to put things together on the integrative approaches side? Yes, absolutely. Uh, mostly the in-between diet and the, and the exercise in terms of, of uh, uh, muscle training, just to make sure they don't lose uh, weight. Then we're, we're not trying to do too many things because this is what we understand. We understand how to fight cancer um, with this fasting mimicking periods, and we understand how to fight it long-term. And we, that knowledge was gained for, from cancer prevention, right? Mm -hmm. So we're combining all the you know, 30 years of work in cancer prevention, anti-aging, cancer prevention, and then we're combining now with the cancer treatment part of the nutrition. And so, um, and so yeah, I think that the, you know, what I call the longevity diet is this, you know, mostly plant-based, uh, um, low sugar, uh, relatively low protein, um, uh, diet that is high in, in legumes and some fish, et cetera, et cetera. So that I think um, I'm pushing for it become, you know, uh, um, central in, in cancer treatment, uh, while of course the physician makes sure that the weight function, I mean, the muscle function and the muscle loss is not there, right? So I think that that's what we are achieving clearly in many trials now, maybe 10 trials. And I think now we just have to bring it to, to everyone, and, and I think it takes a team, right? I think it takes a, maybe like a, a, bio, a molecular biologist, a dietitian, and a physician working together. Sometimes it takes an integrative, we've done it with the integrative uh, doctors, yeah. integrative medicine doctor. Those are the, usually the ones that can sort of maybe do it all, you know, oncologist plus integrative doctor, yeah. or maybe an oncologist plus molecular biologist and a dietitian. Those two teams seem to work. You know. Yeah, yeah. And you, you've spoken about this before about how fasting as a term is very vague. It can mean a, a number of different things. We're specifically talking about FMD here, fasting mimicking diet, which is a five day protocol. Are there other me methods of fasting that perhaps are more appropriate for different people that you believe could be as effective? And are, are there any human trials that you're aware of looking at those modes of fasting as well? Yes. So, I just uh, published a book in Italy on, on cancer and fasting, and uh, and hopefully it'll come to the the well, it's going to come to US next year and hopefully the UK. And in that, we talk about, for example, this large study where they uh, they showed the correlation between 13 hours of fasting or longer daily and progression of breast cancer in breast cancer patients. Right. So that's definitely a recommendation. Um, it, yeah, go for about 13, 14. No, normally I say 12 for everybody else, but I think for the cancer patient, it seems to be uh, uh, the, the side effects of going longer than 12 are probably uh, overcome by the, uh, by the potential benefits. Benefits that are now uh, um, shown uh, to be true, uh, there are associations, of course, right? So we don't know, but you know, the women that fast more than 13 hours do better. So yeah, so that's that's for sure uh, one of the the ones. And now um, I think that's probably it, right? Uh, I, I don't think you start introducing too many things, and then um, and then uh, you can start seeing side effects, like say everyday fasting, uh, five two. I mean, there's all kinds of things you could do, but w as you mentioned, uh, fasting means nothing. Like eating fasting was. What does that mean? You know, if you want to move this into the medical field, even though I get attacked sometimes, oh, but because he's trying to sell, I'm not trying to sell anything because I, I give everything to charity. So this is definitely not it. But I think I realize the standardization, how important it is to standardize it for the physicians all over the world, whether it's Japan or, yeah. or South America or the UK. So it's got to be standardized, it's got to be tested clinically. And then maybe then the, 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 the physicians will start, will start applying it. You know? I would love to ask Walter this, because when I um, put onto social media that I was doing a five day fast, I got people saying, oh, you know, you should be doing whole food, shouldn't be doing this fasting. What, what, what are your thoughts about people who are do, doing kind of replications of the five day fast, yeah. but using whole food? 
Yeah, it'd be like saying, you know, rapamycin comes from the dirt of uh, some island, uh, eastern island or something like that. You know, what if what if the pharmacist and the physician said, you know what, you could do it yourself, you know? You got uh, you just got a transplant. That's what rapamycin is used for. You just got a transplant. You just pick up some dirt and then, you know, you grind it up and uh, yeah, of course, the FDA, we went to the FDA now for hormone therapy and, and cancer treatment, right? It was a long, excruciating set of discussions. And then they said, okay, you got this box? No, right? Let's take this box and let's make it into 14 ingredients. And you tell us exactly what's in it. And you tell us where you're going to pick the food to make that. And now you make it. And maybe, maybe in two or three years, we'll let you do that, right? So you see now the established medical system, how far it is from, oh, I'm gonna go home. And, and, and it was one of the guys, the, the former director of the FDA, I, you know, I, we had this discussion and I said, you know, I think we know why it's working for cancer, et cetera. And he told me, you don't know, you think you know, but what if it was one of the ingredients, you know, that you're adding that for some reason is triggering the microbiota, which is signaling to the immune system, which is causing immunothera immun an immunotherapeutic like effect. And it has nothing to do with what you think is working, right? I mean, of course, it's very unlikely, but what if? That's what he said, right? You know, that's a very good case, right? So, so, uh, so yeah, so that's, that's why it needs to be standardized. And I don't mean we need to spend a billion dollars and, you know, take 10 years. I think it should go very fast, mm -hmm. but it needs to be very standardized. And I think this lifestyle program now the FDA allows that says okay if it's not a drug I'll allow you you standardize it you show me two three four clinical trials you show me consistent like you were saying multiple site doing it make it be you convince me that it, that is true and then with statistics and then I'm not coming after you and you can use it together with muscle training together with a good diet in between and use it in combination with standard of care, right? I, I think this, this is the way to move forward much faster than getting FDA approval, but, uh, but this could change things around from what we've seen now in, in many trials. What I, what I also think is exciting is that working in cancer over many years, it was always like, yeah, all of this is important in prevention, mm -hmm. but it's not important in treatment and you should just go away and have double cream and, and digestive biscuits. Um, and I think what's really exciting with the work that Walter's doing is, you know, making it part of an integrative approach, a treatment during cancer treatments. And for me, the really interesting thing is survival because, you know, maybe not just this element, but other elements that people can take on. Could we really start to turn things around and not just for cancer, but for other long term conditions as well? Yeah, absolutely. And I think the application of this to other conditions is really telling of how you're really getting to the root cause. We talked a little bit about the mechanisms behind why it might be working for things like weight loss, uh, even for, for cancer. What are the other mechanisms that are going on that you believe or you hypothesize are happening when someone goes on the fasting mimicking diet? And just another point is that I definitely appreciate that uh, about the FDA approval because I think when you're measuring exactly what goes into every element of the five days, you know what the micronutrient content is, what the phytonutrient content is, the macros, et cetera. So that's very important if you're gonna prove this model out for various uh, specialties in medicine as well. So mechanisms, um, of course, we and, and now the, the good news is it's expanded to many laboratories all over the world, like animal studies and all that. But for example, the one we published uh, last year um, for, for hormone therapy in breast cancer, uh, we showed, I mean, in, in, in the early days when I used to talk to oncologists, it used to be like, oh, yeah, 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 the fasting mimicking diet. Like, you know, I, I heard there's a story about carrots, people that eat more carrots, they benefit more right so they were not taking us very serious it was almost like wow. yeah okay yeah. like you were saying yeah. but what could this possibly do yeah. and if you look at that paper which by the way is published in nature um you see how the fasting mimicking diet is knocking down leptin insulin and igf1 all three yeah. plus many other things but these three any of these three could make the cancer start growing again so it's palbociclib fulvestrant two hormone therapy CDK4-6 inhibitor, two drugs that are used standard care, plus three different markers that are now, or factors that are now down-regulated by the fasting. So now imagine that you had to have come up with five drugs, which, you, by the way, you don't know what they are. So it, it could be these three drugs for 
one patient. It could be that all of a sudden IGF-1 is no longer important for that patient and glucose becomes important, right? Because now we saw that for stem cell, for cancer stem cells, glucose was important. For differentiated cancer cell, glucose was irrelevant, right? So you, now you had to lower, it was four actually. So glucose, leptin, IGF-1, and, and insulin, right? So that's what the, the field is not appreciating, this wild card effect, right? Revolutionize the system, create a differential property, uh, differential effects. Normal cells, they know exactly what to do, right? They don't care if IGF-1, in leptin, glucose is low. They've seen it starting in bacteria 3 billion years ago. The cancer cells, they just don't care what the environment it is. They're just gonna keep on going. By definition, by the way, it's not my definition, that's the hallmarks of cancer. So yeah, so that rebellion sets them up for failure. But what do we do in the clinic? As you said, eat some donuts, right? Uh, because you're not feeling so good, so maybe eat some donuts, feel better. Well, guess what? That donuts, it's got carbohydrate, uh, and these carbohydrates are gonna help, in this case, those cancer stem cells. And that was enough to get you in the long run. We could drive the cancer down, regression, and then the cancer stem cells slowly because of the glucose took over and the whole thing happened again, right? Even in mice. So, so yeah, it, it's a very complicated, uh, but I think where the, the field, and not just because of us, many, many labs, is getting sophisticated enough to where we're like now can, can sort of smell that we're almost there, right? We're, we're almost starting to understand so much about the cancer that we can, we can trick it into doing exactly the things that will cause every single cancer cell in the body to die, right? I always give the analogy of the, of the desert, right? You say, take a billion people, you put them in the desert. Well, if you give them water, if you give them shade, and if they sit down, you know, after a couple of weeks, you're gonna have a, a billion people alive. If you take the same billion people, you make them run, no shade and no water, you know, two weeks later, probably zero survival, right? Uh, so yeah, the, this is what we're, we're, we're looking at, these differential properties of, of, of uh, living systems. Yeah, yeah absolutely. I, I think it goes hand in hand with metabolic medicine as well. I think a lot more people are talking about it as is evidenced by yeah. this conference. It seems to be uh, on the tip of everyone's tongue. Um, in, in terms of, uh, we've talked about cancer, we've talked about uh, weight. You've got five minutes or are you going to go now? Two minutes. To two minutes. Because <laughs> <laughs> seems talking about metabolic. Oh, is it? <laughs> okay. I've got to introduce Do you make a move? at half past. Well, as, as long as I'm out of here by 20 past, 20 two past. minutes. But... Okay, we'll give it four minutes. I've, okay. I've, got, I've, got, I've got an eye, uh, got okay. an eye in the time, don't okay. worry. <laughs> okay. So uh, we, we talked about uh, the, the approach of FMD to uh, oncology uh, weight. Um, what other areas do you think it could be used that we're not really talking about t today? Yeah, I, I think uh, autoimmunity uh, seems very, very promising. So we have uh, one trial running in Genova uh, for multiple sclerosis. Uh, we have two at Stanford for uh, IBD, uh, both Crohn's and colitis. Um, and, um, you know, s s a number of other hospitals that, that are now looking into um, you know, different uh, autoimmunities. So, yeah, so I think that there's got a lot of potential. We published the mouse data, looks very promising, uh, but the human, we published one trial uh, at Charité, uh, collaboration with Charité Neurologist, and uh, it looked very promising, but of course it, it was a multiple sclerosis, it did not have MRIs, and so the criticism, of course, is it's too early, let's see what happens. It's, it's like cancer 10 years ago, right? So we're in the early days of autoimmunities, um, but I think what is emerging, because somebody listening say, oh, what is it, a miracle now? It works for everything. I think it's about maybe fasting was always there to fix problems, right? I say you cut yourself within a couple of weeks, that wound is perfectly repaired. What if, and, and, and you go to sleep and at night, there's a lot of things being repaired, right? What if fasting represented that periodic moment where everything goes to work to repair. So autoimmune cells probably don't belong there, let's eliminate them. Okay, Pre-cancer cells, they don't belong there, let's eliminate them. Insulin resistant, okay, that maybe it's no longer the, the moment to be insulin resistant because the winter is coming, let's reverse that, right? So that's a possibility. I know it's a, it's a, it's a big claim, but certainly when you see it working with all these different conditions, now we're working on Alzheimer's, right? So we have a clinical trial in Genova, uh, Perugia, 
it's into it's it's about a one year into it um and we're about to publish on the mouse work so it, it, it's just it would be the coincidence that it's working on all these things um is unlikely and so yeah possibly some some fundamental role evolved role for fasting yeah. itself to to fix things we, we've talked a lot about the uh, the benefits of fasting, the potential uses in, in various aspects of, of medicine. I agree. I think when you look at the foundational reasons and the mechanisms, uh, mechanisms as to why it will work, it's understandable as to why it would work in so many different disciplines. Where do you think the drawbacks of fasting in general are and what should we be looking out for? to make sure that we're not tricking ourselves into believing something exists or some mechanism is there when it doesn't? Um, the, uh, for sure, I don't like this idea that because fasting and fasting and making diets are good for you, you should do it all the time, right? Um, I think it's not, it's not a good way to go. And, and I'm, I'm worried about that. I think it's about you do it when you need to do it. Um, and so, it could be it could be that eventually it turns out to be great if you do it say 12 times a year uh, but i think right now I'm, I'm more comfortable with let's say you know two three times a year for people that are healthy and you know in the clinical trials yes we see six cycles a, a year or so working and in the one in heidelberg they just published um, they did six cycles and then they waited three months it was a washout period and then nine months, it was still significant. Uh, the A1C, uh, the insulin resistance uh, uh, drop was still significant. Um, so I think that, that uh, yeah. So then let's say two, or, two to three going all the way to probably six or so for the diabetic. Uh, that seems like a good, uh, uh, of course, the diabetic has got a real problem. And, and, um, and you, you can't say, well, maybe in 20 years, uh, uh, if I do six cycles, uh, I'll have this other side effect because, you know, you have to worry about the di diabetes. And the same is true for, for cancer, right? So, so you got a bigger problem to worry about than, uh, than whatever hypothetical uh, issue may, may happen uh, yeah. later. Yeah. So I think that, again, for, for the fasting mimicking diet and the fasting field in general to, to go forward, we have to be a lot more um, rational and we have to be a lot more careful. Uh, and um, and I think this has got a shot this time to to be, become part of the standard of care. Yeah, yeah. I, I think it's it's really important, and that's a, a great point about um, being cautious with uh, overusing a tool. At the end of the day, we have a selection of different tools. And on that on that um, topic, let's say we have someone who is in general good health and wants to optimize their health. How do they objectively? Uh, decide whether two rounds of FMD in a 12 month period is useful or four or six? Are there specific markers that people should be looking out for to determine what is the sort of Goldilocks amount of, of fasting? Yeah, I think that um, probably good to uh, um, look at all the main markers, you know, so where is your A1C? Uh, what about your cholesterol? What about your blood pressure? So you know, very, very few people after, let's say, age 30 are uh, perfect, let's say, right? Very, very few, maybe 5% or so. Um, so, so you know, your blood pressure could be 132, mm -hmm. uh, and then maybe it was 125, then 128, 130. So you're moving in the wrong direction. Then, you know, the cholesterol was 175, and now it's 207. Um, yeah, so that, that person uh, might need to do three times a year, mm -hmm. um, you know, every four months. And um, and uh, and that may may help or should help, you know, based on the clinical trial, should help. Um, we never done it like that, and we're doing it now. We have five, about to start a 500 patient trial in southern Italy, where we're gonna randomize three groups: uh, control, FMD, FMD plus longevity diet, right? Wow. And so that, I think I hope that's gonna be much more conclusive. And and I, for the first time, we're gonna do it every three months. So in the trials that we've done so far is every month for three months. And then we, we look at three months later without doing it. And it's, it's still impressive. I think even three months later, the effects are still there. But you see them, they're starting to move. In, same as in the Heidelberg trial, right? Three months past the six cycles in the diabetic patients, you see that them going back to the same lowering of uh, insulin resistance that was there at, 
after three cycles, right? Mm -hmm. So yeah, so it's slowly going back. So yeah. it, it tells you that between three and six months, lots of the effects go away if you if you return to a, your normal whatever you you did before, right? Yeah. So of course, yeah, if you change your diet, um, it could be that, and, and that's maybe the answer, right? So mm -hmm. if you start doing all the things right and you eat the everyday longevity diet and you exercise, et cetera, et cetera, you know, maybe a couple of times a year would be enough. Mm -hmm. uh, but for the great majority of people, and, and then it also depends genetically, who are you? You have you know, high cholesterol to begin with. Uh, and, uh, um, you know, do you have uh, cognitive issues? Do you have uh, inflammatory issues? You know, is your CRP high, right? So I think you have to look at the whole thing and, and decide, uh, uh, where you want to be and see how um, the, the FMD helps you get there. And I, I would say the great majority of people, uh, we, see in them, we see them being helped by, by, the, by the FMD. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I, think, I guess the danger is to ensure that people don't slip back towards the baseline as they take away the tool. It's sort of like on a calorie restricted diet, someone will definitely uh, lose weight and they'll plateau and their numbers will improve, blood pressure might improve, depending on the cholesterol that might improve, depending on the diet that they're on. But then as soon as they come off that diet, it comes back up and you change your weight set point and then you see on the graph, it's just trending upwards. So I guess it'd be very interesting to see if FMD as a very nice, applicable short-term intervention that can be routinely applied could maintain a baseline that's actually steady across. Yeah, yeah that's what we see, right? That, that's what we see. And, and I always, I'm always entertained by these studies on, on long-term, you know, very severe restrictions, like 800 calories yeah. for six months. And, and uh, you know, and those are, I'm surprised that some of the big journals are publishing this because we all know what happens, uh, you know, after that. And on top of that, they, they're not aware of the studies showing a metabolic slowdown, right? And which, by the way, was published in the New England Journal of Medicine many years ago. And it's just, we keep on forgetting all yeah. studies, right? And keep getting back into the, so, so yeah, if you do restriction for a long time, your metabolism seems to slow down and now even adjust it for your body weight. So your body drops over 10% and your metabolism may slow down 15%. So now you're in trouble because what is that telling you? You gotta regain your weight, right? It's, it's giving you the signal, go back to where you were because I was happy where you were. And, uh, and that's hard to fight evolution like that, right? So yeah, so the, the, the FMD, we don't see that. That doesn't mean it's easy, but because it allows you after five days and probably for about four months to go back to whatever it is that you were doing. Um, and and I, I really think it's, uh, it's something that could, uh, about a, whatever, a fourth to a third of the, the world is in some pre-diabetic to diabetic uh, state. Um, yeah, so I think that's, that's a group that should use it like that, like you just define, okay, I'm, I'm going back. I, I used to be fasting glucose 90, A1C was 5.4, now I'm 5.6. Uh, and I think in the UK is a different uh, unit, yeah. But but uh, uh, yeah, let me let me do one more FMD. Maybe uh, introduce a little bit more of the components of the longevity diet, um, and uh, and that's how without drastic. And that's a, you know we have two foundation clinics, one in Milan and one in Los Angeles, and that's a recommendation we give to all the nutritionists. Don't make anybody revolutionize their yeah. diet. Yeah. It's never going to happen. So just go with, with small changes that they can have a big effect. And I think 15 days a year, mm -hmm. it's a small enough uh, change that um, the great majority of people, especially those that are pre-diabetic, yeah. they're looking at life or, you know, maybe in six months, I'm going to be a metformin. And then, and then when does it end? And today I'm going to end my talk with a physician in Italy. 67 year old physician that was diabetic and hypertense, went to his friend and his friend told him, I'm sorry, I'm gonna load you up with drugs. And he did, right? Uh -huh. His own uh, professor, university professor, endocrinologist. And so he does that and gets worse and worse and worse. And then we move in and you know, in two years, it's back to like no drugs, no problem. Wow. <laughs> no. Yeah, so it, it, it used to be an anecdote. So now it's clinical trials, right? Exactly. So, so yeah, so I think that we are, uh, we we're excited about this, uh, you know, seeing the physicians uh, yeah. uh, doing it and seeing the physicians saying this is a very reasonable 
and and uh, doable way to to get there yeah yeah i completely agree and i can definitely see the appeal to both physicians and patients particularly when there's going to be a lot more robust clinical trials out there on on humans just to draw this conversation to a close um the longevity diet i love the longevity diet you know me i'm, I'm into my nutrition and healthy eating i think it has to be a uh, flavorful delicious diet that someone has as their baseline you, you have some uh, views on low protein as well and i wanted to ask a bit about how low is low and if that low protein applies to everybody across the spectrum and whether there are instances where there might need to be more protein let's say uh women during the during the perimenopause and menopause or maybe some other uh, aspects of of where a low protein is is not uh recommended yeah for, for lots of people right so for example i wrote a book for children diet and we recommend a higher protein than, than the 0.8 grams per kilogram that we recommend to all the adults and then we publish a, a um, we publish a meta-analysis on igf1 which is dependent on proteins and then we publish a, a, a paper on protein levels showing that over 65 having too low protein diet was detrimental, was associated with a lot of problems. So it looks like they're saying that 20, 25 to 65 biological age, by the way, right? So doctors yeah, yeah. pretty soon, whether they realize it or not, yeah. it's about the chronological age era is about to end yeah, and yeah. the biological age era is about to begin. So, so then the doctor is gonna have to say, well, you really are 64 biologically, even though you know chronologically you may be 73, right? And then, um, yeah, so there is a point where uh, people start losing weight around 65 on average. And that's a point probably where uh, the too low of a protein uh, could be uh, a problem. And so, yeah, so then imagine somebody uh, who's 100 pounds, uh, we're looking at uh, maybe, um, you know, 37, 40 grams of protein minimum. Now it gets tricky because if most of your proteins are from legumes, uh, now you're gonna have very low levels of a few amino acids yeah. and that's not so good for you, right? So this is why we moved to, you know, interesting enough, the old diet of my region in Italy, Liguria, which is pescatarian, right? So lots of legumes, lots of vegetable, but enough fish. And, and, and the other place that has that is where, and, and so keys, did these studies in near Naples, right? Yeah. So, yeah, so fish, because they were poor and that's all they had, and, um, and lots of legumes and lots of vegetable. And it turns out that Genova is now one of the highest uh, um, percentages of over 65 in the world. And, uh, you know, and Enzo Keys made the region in near Naples famous yeah. for, for the Mediterranean diet, you know. Um, but I think now it's like a pescatarian diet of a certain very, um, a very careful uh, dosage of, of fish and the right type of fish seems to be the ideal diet. And I just published on that. Um, and so I encourage everybody. It's a, it's a paper in cell that just came out a couple months ago. And it's, uh, you know, people can download it for free. Yeah. So I encourage everybody to, to, to look at that. Yeah. Oh, we'll link to that in the show notes for sure. And uh, what's your favorite fish? Salmon, Salmon. Uh, <laughs> not necessarily my favorite fish. My favorite is tuna, but it's oh, right. packed okay. with mercury. Yeah. So, so <laughs> yeah. there you go. You know, it, yeah. uh, I eat it maybe once every two months or so. But yeah. But I, I eat salmon maybe a couple of times a week. Yeah. 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 Oh, that's good to know. I have a lot of oily fish in my diet as well. And how, how many? How often do you do FMD in, in a year? Probably a couple of times a year. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 I'm gonna try it, and I'm gonna because uh, I've only done uh, various. I've done various methods of fasting. Uh, but not a full five-day FMD. So I'm gonna I'm gonna do it, and I'll report back to you, and uh, I'll let you know what my numbers are as well. Yeah, I look forward to the the new research. We'll probably have to get you back on the podcast uh, when it's out, and uh, I wish you well with your uh, your lectures today and uh, and the next pods. Well, thank you. If you enjoyed that video, you will love the library of content that we have on doctorskitchen.com. Make sure you hit subscribe, and we have podcasts in our library on brain health, well-being, supplements, and lots more. Have a wonderful day.